us pray. Loving God, God of the promises, help us to remember our promises to you, that our words and our thoughts, our reactions might be a blessing this day always. Amen. Because it is the narrative lectionary, we have another jump in our scripture and in our story. So how did we get here? We had Abram, eventually Abraham, in the land of Canaan. We met Joseph last week and his brothers, and they all ended up in Egypt with his 12, his 12 brothers. The youngest, oh, I wrote this out, but it doesn't seem like. So the way Exodus begins is that it tells us that a king, a pharaoh, rose in Egypt who did not know Joseph. And the king was so, the pharaoh was so concerned about this large group of Hebrew people, the sons of Israel, that he decided they should be, be put aside. Maybe they should live in that land over there that's just outside of the city and just outside of the resources. And somehow, within the 400 years from the time we meet Joseph till we meet Moses, they become slaves in the land of Egypt. Their numbers grow exponentially, as so happens with many people who are oppressed, but also they started with having 12 sons. And if every set of them had another 12, you can imagine how quickly their numbers grew. The Pharaoh, who was ruling at the time, decided that clearly there was only one option, and that was to have the baby boys thrown into the Nile as soon as they were born. And there was a rebellious faction, the, the midwives Shifra, Shifra and Pua. And when their work, when they weren't able, the rebellious factor, dress, dress, other drastic measures were taken. In one such instance, a baby was placed into a basket, floated down the river, and landed in the arms of one of Pharaoh's daughters, probably one of many. He probably had many wives. And then was raised and cared for, both in a Hebrew home and in the palace. And somehow Moses knew he was a member of the community and recognized that his people were enslaved and oppressed and brutalized, and he murdered one of the slave drivers. Inevitably, Moses takes off. He flees to Midian, um, where he gets married. He becomes a shepherd. He does a lot of walking, apparently, because eventually he ends up at the base of Mount Horeb, or Sinai, um, where he finds a bush on fire that doesn't burn up and meets God, who calls him back to Egypt calls him back to Egypt to set the people free. Where we land today is at the end of nine of the plagues, and Moses has been meeting, calling for them to be set free, and Pharaoh has refused until we get to chapter 12. It's a moment everything changed. Everything was going to be different. Now, the Hebrew people are going to leave from Egypt and go to Mount Horeb, eventually. Next week, we'll be at the base of Mount Horeb, where they'll receive the law. However, today, they're right about there. They have left the city of Egypt, whatever city they're in. Again, they're on their way to Canaan, they're by way of Mount Horeb, but right now, that's where they are. They haven't crossed the sea. They're just in transition from one place to the next. Everything is going to be different going forward, and they need to remember how that will be, how they will remember it, how they will pass it on, and that is what our story was about today. Now, what we have in our story is one of the rituals that sets the ritual for one of the holiest days in the Jewish year. 
And it's the new year because God tells Moses that this will be the start of your year and will to act as a community that they will eat together if they can. And it's an act of memory, teaching themselves and each generation what is to come. And it's kind of wild that God is giving them this act and sharing it with the people before they have even gone through the moment that they're going to remember. Before they're totally freed from the Egyptians, because they're about to follow them. Even before they have crossed the sea, they are given the act to remember it. And it's like God knew that our memories were flawed and faulty, and God knew they were going to forget and needed them specific instructions on how to remember. Now, for many years, I think rituals have been given a bad name. Young folks will talk about hollowed rituals. Yeah, I don't know. It might be me. It might be my folks, as young as young. Uh, hollow rituals and how that makes them meaningless. And maybe there's a point to that. If you don't know why you're doing a thing, then it is just performing a ritual, and so it's just performance. And I think there are many years in which the Protestant churches, like ours, feared anything, anything that reminded them of Catholicism. That's how you end up with many churches like this one, the UCC, with a desire to go completely in the opposite direction and having no ritual. <laughs> we have some minimal ritual practices and sometimes minimal liturgy at all. Now, if you do a quick search on the internet for rituals, you, what you will find online are companies, a company selling daily individualized vitamins or supplements, an app for ordering food and takeout, and a non-alcoholic spirit company, and a Netflix movie, it's horror, and a coffee company, and a multitude of yoga and spa-like companies. There are many, many people beyond companies beyond that that are using ritual as part of their marketing scheme. They say that what they have to offer is a brand new morning ritual or your bedtime ritual. And then there are books that tell you that you should have a morning ritual or an evening ritual but often they're just trying to t sell you a mushroom supplement drink that you can have. Oh, I was gonna include a picture, I didn't. I was introduced to Casper Turkile's uh, The Power of Ritual, it's a book. He also did the, um, does the podcast Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. It's a great, great podcast, I feel like you guys care. Um, and in it, he writes about ritual in the modern age as somebody and on behalf of people who are not necessarily religious. And in his introduction, he writes, um, people didn't just talk about their community. They said, CrossFit is my church. Do you guys know CrossFit? It's like the intense workouts where you take a, a tractor tire and you lift it and flip it and then you have the big, it's, it's intense, it's intense. Uh, CrossFit is my church became the refrain. When interviewing a Harvard Business School student, she said, CrossFit box, it's a gym, is my everything. I met my boyfriend and some of my very best friends through CrossFit. We started, when we started apartment hunting in spring, we immediately zoned into the area in our neighborhood closest to our CrossFit. And even though it would increase our commute to work, we did it because we didn't bear le to leave our community. At our box, we have babies and little kids crawling around everywhere, and it has been an amazing experience to watch the little ones grow up. He goes on to talk about community gatherings and community meals and maker spaces and pilgrimages to festivals or sacred places, tough mutter competitions, sporting events and teams, yoga communities. For his writing and understanding, people are trying to put meaning and purpose and structure to their lives and community to their lives, particularly in these days when fewer and fewer people are, practicing part of, are part of practicing religious communities. And religious communities, dare I say, have not always done a good job at offering these kind of meaning-making experiences. 
He goes on to write primarily about how we can imbue ordinary moments or parts of our day that already exist, or like a hike into a ritual, reconnecting with ourselves, with creation, with community, and with what he called the transcendence, the divine or God, however the reader might understand it. Now, if you think the UCC is weak on ritual, I would like to introduce you to the Unitarian Universalists. Now, the Unitarians don't have a history of ritual, in a sense, because there isn't a particular set of doctrinal rules. And every congregation you go to, and every service you attend, might look completely different from another congregation or community, and last week's service at the same one. But, Allison Palm and Heather Concannon, at the grieving the loss of a friend, realized that not having practices of ritual was a detriment to them and how they were going to grieve and move on. And so they wrote a book that sometimes people use ritual to mean just repeated actions. And other times it implies an element of intent or tradition or spirituality. They define ritual as an embodied participatory way to mark a transition or facilitate transformation. And in doing so, ritual connects us to something larger than ourselves, to community, to the holy, to seasons, to cycles of life and death. And so I don't think that taking a morning multivitamin is necessarily a ritual or something we should build a ritual around. But I wonder if taking the, a one pill or five pills or 30 pills that are the difference between your life and your death, I wonder if that couldn't be ritualized as it connects us to today and tomorrow and to our mortality. They would go on to write about how rituals can be both aspirational and memory both facilitating change and affirming the change that has taken place. And I think that's what Moses is doing, preparing the people for change. That is to take the change that is to take place and imbuing it with memory to come back to every year. And from the time there was a temple, the Hebrew people and the Jewish community come back to this ritual. And it looks completely different than it did. I brought out, there's, there's a Haggadah, it's the, the ritual, the book of ritual for Passover. It is a lot more than what you find in chapter 12 and 13. But you can look at it. <sighs> but they repeat the story every year. They ask every time, why is this night different? Why do they eat different food? Why do they tell the story different? It was a marked change in their community. Not just an act, not just a ritual to come back to, but what tells them that they are different. They mark time differently. They will mark time by different from what the empire makes for them, for the world. The empires of this world tell them they should be marked by, to tell them that they belong to God and not to the empires of this world. They belong to the God who desires their liberation and well-being. They live in community differently. It wasn't about making sure those without have what they need, but it's making sure that if you have enough, you give it away. The Hebrew people were on their way to Sinai where they would receive the law and they would learn the cycles of life and the ritual of rest for themselves, for their slaves, that they, and for any animals they might have, and for the land. It wasn't just about a moment. It wasn't just about the liberation, but it was about preparing them to, to be the people they would need to be when they entered the land that was promised to them. It's a marked transition from who they were under the empire and its slave to who they would be and who they were becoming and they return to the ritual every year to remember 
and to find out if there was a way they swayed back towards the uh, being under the empire and set things right again to right any of the ways in which they weren't living into the new life and the promises they were called to in this moment. The telling of the story of the ritual was a reclaiming of their place in the story. It's not that they are part of the broader community, the extended generations, but when they get together to tell the story, they say when we, when we were slaves in Egypt, they embody completely that it was them who was set free from the bounds. And so, I wonder about the rituals of the church. How do we mark time? I wonder about the rituals of the church. Our year begins on Advent, on the first Sunday of Advent. And do we mark time differently as being part of this community when the new year doesn't start on January 1, but somewhere around the end of November? This year it's December 1st, just as a thing to be aware of. Do we live life differently because of our call to love and live in this time? Does it change the way that we eat for us to tell the story of who we are and who we are becoming? Maybe. And ritual for us is symbolic and it is an act, but we can't do it for ourselves. They, they help us Rituals help us make sense of the world around, for the, around us, for the things that we can't make sense of by ourselves. They, rituals make the tangible of the intangible. They connect us to the divine, to what has been, who has been with us and is before going before us and is within us and is with us always. And ritual connects us to each other in ways that words can't always do so. Now, friends, this is probably my least sermon-like sermon ever. But what I was wondering this week is if there are things that you haven't been able to put words around or something you've been through, some grief, some loss, some illness. It may be years ago. It may have been recently. that has defined who you are today, that who you were before and who you are today are not the same person. Something that should be marked, something that should recognize that change, and the change of who you are in your person and in relationship and in our community. And I wonder if there are things from your past that you did or that were done to you that you need to let go of or need to process or leave because you carry them? Maybe you need to learn to live with your own flaws? Or maybe it's the transition into adulthood for you or someone you know that needs to be marked. Maybe turning 18 is a celebration that's noted, but, but then you need to ritualize the next step, right? Because becoming an adult I may take decades, <laughs> and maybe we need to mark those on a regular basis. I wonder if the we, whoever we is in the universal cosmic church, that we made a mistake when we spiritualized this place and this time and separated it from the rest of our lives. That the world out there and the church don't seem to have much to say to each other about the times in our lives and the change that comes into our lives. Instead, we try to force our lives to fit into the rhythm of church, into the rhythm of our calendars. So we only talk about mortality and the finality of, of our speaking on Ash Wednesday, and we only talk about grief on All Saints Day, and we only talk about community once a month have communion together, and then we leave this space, and we leave it behind for a week or a month or until next year when the cycle rolls around again. And if we hold these moments as sacred, these moments of transition in our lives, these times of transition, I wonder 
how it could change the community that we are part of, how it might change ourselves if we saw every moment within our lives and the lives of each other and the lives of our, communi our communal life together as something to hold dear, as something sacred, to hold up before God for each other and to celebrate and to grieve and to contemplate and to make acts of and to recognize and to name. Because I change our view of our lives, our faith, our community, our communal life. I think it would mean that when the scary shows up, because the scary is going to show up, that we will know we're not alone, that we don't have to think about it by ourselves. And I think it means that when the times of bittersweet change arrive, we'll know we're not alone. And when we find ourselves at the grief of a loss of a partner, a child, a miscarriage, that we know that those are named and not forgotten, and that you know you're not alone. And the Hebrew people went outside, and they stood there roasting their lambs or their goats with their staves in their hand, eating, however it is that they were eating, and they could look down the road and see that their whole community was standing there doing the same thing they were. They knew they were not alone and they trusted that God would go with them and before them and behind them and protect them. They trusted in the God who recognized that this moment, that that moment was a turning point and a transition and it needed to be named and it needed to be remembered and it needed to be passed down. And I think there's a place for telling our stories, for marking the sacred in our lives. And so I'm, when we sing, I'm going to get pieces of paper that I forgot to get to invite you to consider the places, the times in your life, in lives of each other, in community that might need to be named and marked and recognized in ritual like we have communion or like we have baptism in like we do things with rocks on different Sundays, or we write and put post-its on our windows. What are the things that maybe we need to recognize? I have examples. I wasn't going to give us examples, but maybe some of them will recognize and be part for you. Um, a milestone, or giving birth, or starting school, which we do, coming out, Retirement, affirming names and pronouns, a new home or a separation. These are, um, these actually all come from the Unitarian book. Doo -doo -doo. That may be um, some ritual of marking a service dog partnership. I don't know that we have anyone with a service dog, but that would be the best. Or a planned hospitalization, or an anniversary of, a, of scattering ashes. We can go back through these later. Um, and rituals for community of mending broken covenants or saying goodbye or celebrating the harvest or celebrating coming out day. Are there festivals and things that we want to remember and we want to name and want to be part of our life together? So I will get paper and pass them out and let you think about it. Um, I do think healing from trauma in the news seems like something we could probably do every week, huh? So friends, I mean, there's usually a, a word of affirmation at the end of a sermon. The word of affirmation is you are not alone. And maybe you will write something down and there is somebody next to you or near you that says, yeah, me too. Actually, I needed that too. And know that you are not, that you're not alone, that you don't have to travel this life alone, that we can mark our time and our transitions together. And so friends, let us 